here we go again. We're jumping back into the Rite of Spring. We've moved on from the first part to the second part now. And today we have a very special passage because this passage was lifted basically directly from this piece and used in Star Wars uh, by John Williams. So this is one of those instances where a film composer decides to just steal something that was previously a piece of contemporary or classical music. So let's jump right into it and see how it's put together. Here we go, second part introduction, the exalted sacrifice. Um, this introduction movement is actually quite long. I'm not sure if we're gonna get through it today. Uh, it, it is quite long, but this initial section is, as you will have already heard, the section that was lifted and used in, I believe the desert scene in Star Wars. So let's look at this. He sets up uh, a very spooky texture here, and this texture is achieved with clarinets and flutes. Now, the thing that's interesting about this to me immediately that just jumps off the page is that the clarinets appear to be playing above the flutes, which is not particularly always the case. So that I think is gonna be something that makes this sound a little bit unsettling. We're used to instruments in a certain combination. Like I've kept saying throughout all the parts of this, we always see our instruments in similar combinations when we have large orchestral tutis, that kind of thing. So now changing the role and moving those instruments into a different orientation can actually create a very unsettling or um, maybe like mystical or sometimes um, novel texture. So in this case, we have the flutes and they're on F sharp major. Uh, sorry, D sharp minor. This is a key that I never play. So they're moving back and forth between minor chords. And then. So there. There they're jumping through a diminished seventh chord at the end of the bar. So right here at the end of the bar, we've got ourselves a diminished seventh chord here. That's a bit better, a little bit comfier overall. Okay, so diminished seventh chord at the end of the bar, but the beginning of the bar is all minor chords. Um, and then let's see what the clarinets are doing. So the clarinets are doing a slightly different passage. They're alternating back and forth between two different chords. So in this case, the E clarinet has a D sharp and the other two clarinets have, so we have the same chord in the clarinets, but then they start on that chord and they're gonna alternate down to the other chord. And then that is the F becomes an A. So what we actually have here is a, there's a tritone relationship in the, in the clarinets. So they're going from a D sharp minor chord to an A major chord, back and forth. The voice leading is quite good. They're quite close to each other. Uh, he's he's orchestrated in a way that it looks like they're skipping a lot, but they're not. The like the chords are quite close together. You don't have to actually just jump. That sounds kind of clunky. The other way is a little bit smoother. So if we put this together, this so technically there's this, and then it goes. So. This part goes up like this, and this part goes up. Ah, uh, uh, so it's like a seventh chord in the second second one. So it goes like D sharp minor, uh, A, A7. Oops. You can just do lowercase, then you don't need any other symbols. So D sharp, A7, D sharp, A7. This is a, this is a small passing idiom. That all makes sense then. 
uh, because then it's anchored against this A here, and then this A here in the ovos, and then back. So you can see here that the only thing moving is is these um, are these. Uh, I'm going to call them. They're like an ostinato. So I'm just going to like circle them with purple. So we have this ostinato going. It's set up between these two instruments. The ostinato is quite interesting from a pitch perspective because we have tritone related chords. That tritone related, um, having tritone related chords is just further emphasizing this fact that Stravinsky has been trying to create tritone relations throughout this entire piece. Then we have a whole bunch of A's in the horns and A in the oboe. So horn and oboe playing background material. This is like something, it feels like directly lifted out of a Mozart symphony. Mozart's always peddling notes in the orchestra with, um, with the horns of the oboes. Just like you need a sustained pitch to kind of glue the harmony together. Well, Mozart's gonna use a horn or an oboe. So I'm gonna call them background. They have the background pitch of the second chord, not the first chord. I think this would feel a little bit more grounded and rooted if Stravinsky had given the background pitch instead um, to a different instrument. Or sorry, if he had given it um, a pitch that corresponded with the first chord. Um, funny enough, the, the low horn is actually playing a D. So uh, it's that's real weird. So we have this strong emphasis on A with spooky. And then we have this awesome little gesture, which kind of, I'm going to call this primary material because this really sticks out as being quite important. This sets the mood like crazy. So in this case, we have F sharp, C sharp in the bass, and then we're going towards this chord. Is that right? Looks right. But the upper parts do not, do not, uh, do not. So everything is starting on an A, an A, and an F. So this chord. Um, and the trumpets are playing with this. So we have trumpets, they're doing the. going to arrive on an, an E, oh, an E minor chord. Interesting split chord tone here. F to G sharp. I bet, I bet this is the poly chord that we've had this entire piece. B. So it's E7 with a Yep. This is almost the exact same polychord that we've had for most of the piece. Before it was a little bit different. So before it was this without the uh, D natural. Now instead we have a D natural. So there's basically like one added note, but this polychord is essentially the same polychord we've had the entire time. In this case, E7 plus B flat minor. Good. Let's take a listen to the opening of this. Here we go. That's really cool. That's really cool. Like, I, I can see why John Williams would lift this for kind of like spooky, mysterious music and then just use it directly in one of his scores. Uh, it's very effective at doing that. So, this 
that connection between the A and the B flat minor triad is, is actually really effective. So it's interesting that he has the F down here because the F then connects better to the next chord, to the B flat chord. So, oops, sorry. Yeah, it's a really neat sound. And these trumpets are very quiet. They don't, they don't actually stick out much in that texture. Let's listen to it one more time. Yeah, so the trumpets don't really stick out that much. They're just very sinuous and in the background. Okay, so I assume that this kind of uh, gesture is going to continue here. He's got the violins now going through. Um... Oh. That's actually really jumpy. Oh no. Yeah. So the violins are jumping a little bit there. And everyone else is also jumping. So it's it's actually a longer version of the 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 violins just add emphasis to this entire gesture. So this bottom part is the same as the top part, but the violins add emphasis on the final little crescendo up. Again, when you want the orchestra to sound louder or to um, grow in size, put more people in. It's uh, key to note that the um, the strings are heavily divided here, and they're using harmonics and they also have a mute on. So those are all things that are going to dramatically impact this sound. Also the trumpets are muted. So everyone's muted. It's this more restrained, quiet sound. Uh, and then he's actually going to have a uh, flautando cantabile here when the string material comes back in at the end of this page. So you can see string is going to be primary stuff. Everyone else is probably doing the same thing. Yep. So Ostinato is going to finish up for this section. We've got the harmonic underpinning, which is also going to drop off basically as the end of this bar arrives. So let's listen to the end of that section. It's very slow music. So he resets, goes back to the initial stuff. You can actually really hear there when the violins come in, how the texture just thickens up a little bit. Again, violins are divided in three, so they're not gonna like, the first violins are not gonna really predominate and just like destroy everyone else so that like the texture becomes unbalanced or something like that. If you maybe added four string sections here, it would, especially with the size of the orchestra that Stravinsky is working with. In, in today's orchestras, dividing in three is, is quite hard just because of the number of string players you have. If you have a small orchestra, you might have like eight string players uh, in the section. And so then you are gonna have two people on one part and three people on each other part. Whereas if you had a huge orchestra, like he probably had your 12 to 16 violins in each section, uh, you're gonna have enough strings to just divide in three if you want, or in like some really strange cases, divide by like six or something like that. Uh, that's something that uh, Debussy does. Nice. So that that move, uh, he just repeats those chords basically. I think he goes to a slightly different one the second time. Yeah, so the first one he goes to the here. And then the second one, he goes further. There. The B flat minor chord is related by common tone to the C minor chord and uh, yeah, the C sharp minor chord. They almost form a diminished seventh chord, just those two chords combined, but they don't quite. So 
He's creating a connection between chords like that. I wonder if this music is actually all derived from an octatonic scale. Yeah. Yeah, this is all derived from an octatonic scale. Um, if you have octatonic on B and you start with um, with whole tone from B flat, sorry, from B flat, you go. So, yeah. That octatonic scale contains all the pitch material from this section. No, I clicked on the ground. Um, so that's worth noting. It's always worth noting octatonic on B flat. Major second starts. Again, go in, analyze these things in depth. Don't just do a cursory analysis where you look at the gestures and that kind of thing. Because a lot of the depth of this music, especially classical music, is in the pitch material. Um, this would make more sense. It would make more sense to just go through something quickly and just like grab the song structure or the structure of the piece or something like that. If it's like a film composition or it's um, pop music, just because the pitch is probably interacting in a much weaker way, uh, other elements of the music are going to be the important elements. So in this case, it makes sense to go through and, and really pull things apart from a pitch on a pitch level, figure out exactly how Stravinsky is putting together these wonderful textures, also from an orchestrational perspective. Okay. So let's, I want to listen to these like two or three bars and then we can make a judgment about what material is primary and what material is not. It looks like we have two opposing gestures and some sustained notes. This is awesome. This is in like every Star Wars score. Uh, so we start, we actually have really high oboes. That's probably the highest note that you could write for an oboe, the G flat, an octave above that, uh, because he's got the oct octava. Um, so we actually get these really high oboes on primary material, and they come down. And then they actually merge here with the low flutes, and the low flutes continue the gesture. I think that the reason he does that is he actually wants this to sound quite weak. So as you come down in range, the oboes are going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And so, or sorry, as you come down in range, the oboes are going to get stronger and stronger and stronger and more honky as they approach their low C on the ledger line below the staff. And so to avoid that honkiness, he, he just like goes discontinue the oboes, put it on the, put it in the flutes for now. Okay. Sordino trumpets going up in contrary motion against that gesture. Whoa, what are you doing, cellos? Jumping around like crazy. All right. The violas are jumping too. Tutti divisi. Hmm. That's an interesting marking. <laughs> Tutti divisi. What? I guess he wants them to come together onto the same part, but then he wants them to divide on that part. That's like the funniest marking, tutti divisi. Uh, that's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, it's, it's all this is primary material. Also, that's the nice thing. Once you've analyzed pitch, you can usually go through then and derive what the pitch is from other sections very quickly because you have a sense of what he's doing. So here he's going from like an F flat, F flat, oh God. D flat minor chord, which is actually a C sharp minor chord. So he's going through a bunch of minor chords. These are parallel minor chords. Parallel minor chords. And what do the trumpets have? They also have parallel minor chords, the same minor chords. Um, this probably is where actually um, John Williams lifts this idea of parallel minor chords uh, and parallel major chords. We saw parallel major chords earlier in this piece, uh, just a small passage with the trombones. Now we have parallel minor chords. So, yeah. And this time we have a D sonority. 
What note is that? It looks like a B. That's an A. This is a D minor chord. Yep. Yep. Confirmed. D minor is the harmony. The key of all things psychological, as was said by Simon Rattle when he was talking in. Uh, what was that series called? That's a great docu-series. You should all watch that if you haven't seen it already. So uh, let's listen to this again. It's really nice actually, because we you have the grounding of that D minor chord in the background. And then you have on top of it, or it's gonna be hard for me to play this. Uh, what was the chord? Oh yeah, that's to. He's got them parallel though. Yeah, on top of. So. It's, it's spooky because none of the minor chords that he's using are really related to D. They're like in a completely different world. There's just this D minor chord and then a bunch of stuff that, that uh, isn't really related. Tonally, that is. Again, he's created this sense of bitonality or polychordalism throughout the entire piece. So it's not really a surprise when you get when you get something like this. And then he has these really high notes as primary material in between in the violins. So if you note here, the violins all discontinue before they play, oops, on red, before they play this material. That's actually key. So this happens with a lot of uh, new students when they're first, and that's that's not primary material. This happens with a lot of new students, happens with me a lot uh, when you start writing music, or especially for orchestra. You start like you just write a violin sustained note, and then at the end of the stage sustained note, you just write a little melody that they play. It's primary material. You don't give them any rest. Well, it's really nice to give your musicians a rest, a small, even just a small rest, to kind of reset their brain, reset their playing technique before they play something that is in a different uh, layer than what they were previously in. So before those guys were all basically background. Some were playing the celli and violas were playing primary material. And then we want to change their role. So give them a small rest and then let them play the other material. The The one person that continues, which is the, the viola section, uh, they just play an octave above on a harmonic to the note that they were already playing and they stay primary material. So that's fine. Uh, this chord is a, G, A, D. Super simple. And the cellos are playing the same thing, but an octave or but. Is that what they're playing? Let's listen. <laughs> That's great but I didn't hear what I wanted to hear. Again, didn't hear what I wanted to hear. It is what they're playing. That's really dark. It's really dark. Um, it's wonderful. So he, he has, uh, I think a lot of the darkness is being added here by a rolled timpani and rolled bass drum. Also the extremely low tubas, tubas are on like this note. So they are adding a ton of heaviness to that sound. Uh, 
I think that that's where you're getting most of this darkness of the sound. It's like he's really filled out the orchestration for this D minor chord from bottom to top and then chose uh, the trumpets muted and then the oboes, which are quite high to play and violins, of course, and violas to play this descending material. Great. So he does this three times. And the third time it appears that he changes where he wants to go with this texture. So the texture changes. It looks like we have a similar style of writing here at 82. So it looks like flutes are gonna be continuing playing chords. These chords are an E flat minor chord and a B flat minor chord. That's all stuff we come to expect and a D flat minor chord, which is also the chord that we would expect. So those are all the stuff that we've had previously. I'm gonna circle this all as primary material. I, I think it's worth noting at this point that you can see how slowly he's going through all this material. Everything else is probably back up. I think that we're probably gonna start hearing this chord progression in this area as important because it's the only thing moving. We'll listen through a couple of these gestures again. It's very evocative music. You can see why it's been lifted for film music. Okay, here we go. Those tremolos in the in the violins uh, and the cello really stand out as a new element, it's enlivening this texture which we haven't had before. Before it was just static texture. So even here, when he brings it back um, the third time, something has been changed. It's also shorter. There's the bass moving. Okay, so the bass moves now, which uh, creates a sense that things are moving forward to some extent. Uh, does the sustained pitch change? Yep, it does. So now he's moving harmonically. From A, down to G, down to F sharp. From A. A down to G, okay, ah. So we have um, what appears to be some kind of voice exchange. So it's going up by like this. So we start here on A. So he moves contrary motion, voice exchange, X progression to get there. Nice. And then he returns E. And then we have an extended passage here with alto flute and um, again, C rests, then entrance on primary material. That's very good. So I think that at this moment, when the harmonics come in, this stuff is gonna go into middle ground texture. And then we've got support down here from this chord progression. This chord progression appears to be an F minor chord in first inversion. And then it goes, the bottom note goes down to G. And then the top note Pretty simple, actually. It's just uh, F minor, and then uh, like a quartal chord, and then 
from the chordal chord, we get like a dominant seventh chord, essentially. Uh, G dominant seventh chord at the end. Yep. Where are we? Oh, that's the... Whoa, that's weird. <laughs> that's so spooky. So here where we have these violins playing this uh, harmonic line with the alto flute, like the alt, okay, the violins are up here. That's a really high C sharp for the violins, by the way. Makes sense that it's a harmonic, so violins are way up here. And alto flute is two octaves lower. Uh, and then these oboes really come through as spooky. Without a sustained note behind them, they take on kind of a different quality. They don't have that same high sustained note, sort of blending the oboe, oboe sound. Nice. Then he repeats this passage, bringing in viola solos at the end. The viola solos are doing the same thing that the violins did, they're just lower. So viola solos are gonna take primary material here until the fermata. We've got some of this interesting accompaniment. Oh. Not you, you're part of the primary material. Like this. Okay, let's continue. Okay, that's that phrase. Oh. It's so weird. Did you hear how weird it is with the violas? Okay, I'm gonna look at the bass part. The violas are so strange. Look at them being all weird. They're quite high, so they're they're not like really high, but they're quite high for the violas. Again, Shelly can play in that range, but so they're but they're weird because they're a viola first of all, and they're solo. So no chorus effect. Subtracted the chorus effect because they're solos. So solos, because they're solos. And then um, because there's no chorus effect uh, and they're a viola, their sound box is too small and they're playing high, they have this very abnormal weird sound that we don't expect from the strings. We have this like, that's so neat in the, so it's all semitone motion, but it's displaced over octaves. Uh, it's really cool effect underneath the violas. Let's listen to the fermata. Nice. Then we, it appears we're going to get a little uh, trumpet gesture. You can sight read this trumpet gesture, I believe. Looks like uh, octatonic material. Yep. Not octatonic at the end when the C natural comes in. That is so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the quietest thing we've heard th this entire piece. It's quite interesting to me that he has all of this like climactic, really big loud music, and then he really calms things down for a long time. The most so far, the whole first section is very, very active. And then this just calms things down like, like a lot. And I think that, um, that's actually probably why when I was a kid, I didn't really get past this movement ever. I, I listened to the second half of the Royal Spring much less than the first half. 
And it's probably largely because this section kind of has that lullaby quality. It's almost like trying to put you to sleep, just like calm down, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We have to remember when music was being performed in these days, there wasn't really recorded musically commercial commercially available. So the sort of the intent that composers had going into a piece was very different. You wouldn't go into a piece thinking someone's going to listen to this six or seven times. They're going to fall in love with it. They're going to keep listening to it throughout their life and continue to revisit it with the score, that kind of thing. That was not possible and no one would have conceived that that was even an option. So because of that, uh, you have a lot of pieces like this that they're written in a way so that it would like they're written in a way to directly um, to directly interface with the psychology of someone being in a concert hall and listening to the piece only once. So if you're listening to this piece only once, it doesn't matter that for like three minutes or four minutes in the middle of the piece, there's some music that's just got interesting textures, but it's not really moving too fast. And it doesn't have like a ton of stuff in it that you're like, oh yeah, that's like super memorable. Like when I listen to this, I don't think super memorable music. I think background music in Star Wars when they need to write spooky, mysterious music. So we're obviously going to have primary material here in these five, great, on these five celli solo that are really high up. They're playing a chord, which is why and he's going to break me with the tenor clef. Practice your tenor clef, so. And that note in the tenor clef is G flat. Okay. And that note. Oh, this is such a weird chord. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's an A, A flat. The first chord. Okay, I have to read the final note. I was like, can I, can I do this without that note? No, I can't. It's an E flat. This is like a diminished seventh chord with a major seventh added onto it. And then he arrives uh, here. Oh no, he is. No, 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 that's right. Sustains the... Wait. Let's see. Learn your, alt learn your tenor club. So we have then B flat, F, G flat. Oh, I was right the first time. This one is almost a whole tone chord with an F natural. It's an F natural. Cool. The diminished seventh plus major seventh. Now we have all tone chord plus F. It appears now that we move. Oh, okay, so these are still these the these minor minor seconds that have been displaced to create a very interesting accompaniment pattern. Not the greatest shape to draw. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, and then we have primary material in these uh, horns. They're probably muted. Then we go back here. You can see that the horns are all moving parallel on minor chords. So, Oh no, that's diminished chord. Diminished chord, then a minor chord, then a diminished chord, then a diminished chord. No, then a then a minor, minor major. Let's listen to it. Maybe there's wrong notes in this score. That's a, this is an amazing texture. 
This texture I could use for film, film scoring. I would love to use this actually for film scoring. The horns have a kind of romantic sound to them and this idea of the violin sort of reaching up into this high register and then coming back down uh, is very evocative. It has a very emotional quality while not overly emotional. Oh, it's... Nice. Yeah, I guess it is playing diminished chords. So if it's E flat, then it would be A flat. Yeah. Ah, that's how he makes it work. So the chords that the uh, the chord that the horn starts on forms a dominant seventh with the chord in the in the lower part. So it forms a dominant seventh. Because we have that dominant seventh between the parts, it like makes diminished chords contextualized and sound good if they are a part of the if they're part of the dominant seventh. So that's a really great way to um, if you have if you want to write diminished chords or a diminished melody, something like that, you can do it quite easily if you just yeah, just include um, just include a dominant seventh underneath it. Okay, we got two lines here for this super slow music. And I assume that Stravinsky is gonna to need to do something pretty soon. Like he, he needs to get us out of here. Yeah, so he's gonna to go to some interesting texture here. That's gonna hopefully like grab our attention and then take us back into this, some solo horn music for a moment and then close this movement. Because you cannot write slow music for like eight minutes and expect people to stick, stick around. Especially in today's, especially in like today's era of music, unfortunately we because we have music everywhere. This is a this is a problem that we we face as composers these days. Because there's music everywhere and people just have instant access to whatever they like, they can just continue to consume what they like and never explore new things. Now that isn't always the problem for everyone, but I know I fall into that sometimes where it's just like oh, I only want to listen to the like Tchaikovsky Five again or something like that. Instead of going and listening to a new symphony by like Radovara or Penderecki or something like that. And because of that, uh, people engage with art slightly differently because they can just have what they want. So if you're going to write like Stravinsky wrote, right, writes here for a long extended period of time, you have to realize that like psychologically, your listeners and your audience may not stick around for the entire thing. They can just click on a different YouTube video and go somewhere else. So. Yeah. Turn that up slightly because the trumpet is very quiet. Okay, this this section is wow. It's uh really long. I'm gonna skip ahead. This is very tense. Very tense. This this is uh this is like a third element. And that element is made up of two things. There's pizzas um, emphasizing some moments of the gesture and it feels like a tension building device. What are the notes? So we have this and then dominant seventh chord. Does that dominant seventh correspond with the one in the other parts? It does. Excellent. And then we arrive at these gestures and the gestures look as if they lead up and then they land on a note. Flag. I think that what he's saying is like fleur rocher. I, I, no, that's like the candy. He's, it's a French word for um, flash, flasher, flasher, eh? Don't Don't quote me on this, I don't speak French. I heard it a lot when I was in Montreal, um, but it means harmonic. 
So I think that that's what he's doing. He's arriving up here on these high winds that are in a, that are playing a harmonic. And this wind, these winds are playing just a C major chord. Yep. And he arrives at them through a C major chord. Yep. Everyone C. So we go primary material up to this chord. There's nothing else happening. It's a gesture like that. Okay, let's go again. Where am I? Mouse, come back. Go back to my, there we go. Okay, so here. It's so slow. <laughs> it's so slow. He's really taking us into like a wild meditative place. all dominant seventh chord moving around within a dominant seventh chord but octatonic motion ah has anyone heard this ever in in a film score <laughs> bet everyone's heard this in a film score before so we have Yeah, it's just a dominant seventh chord arriving on the major triad and it's on harmonics in the flute. Now, every time someone writes harmonics in a flute like this, I'm just like, I don't know. It might be better to just write the notes in the flute, mark pianissimo and go dolcissimo. So like what Stravinsky has done without the harmonics, uh, unless you know that the harmonics actually work. I, I'm not a flute expert, so it's hard for me to know. Underneath all of this, we have a B flat, a B, oh ho ho, split chord tone. So here we can describe this as a dominant flat nine. Uh, am I right? No, I'm wrong. No, this B flat nine. This is just a, there's, there's a ninth between the thirds, but yeah, split chord tone. So a split chord tone. But we have continued these gestures. He's using a string gliss to get through those harmonics. That's how he arrives. So strings do a gliss, uh, strings do a gliss, winds do a little run through the major triad, and then they arrive on flutes up high. And he also has, uh, lovely, he has basses playing the harmonics as well. So that's how you get this kind of spooky sound. Basses playing harmonics, and then everyone else playing the, the gesture um, up. Obviously don't brass. And then the, the brass are gonna come in in a little bit. Let's listen to a couple of these runs. They're really nice. I'm specifically thinking about the dark crystal. I feel like this this sort of gesture is something I heard in that movie when I was a kid. Jim Henson's Dark Crystal. Yeah. Whew. Very interesting. Very evocative, very, very, very effective from Stravinsky in terms of writing. He's got the, the, these high runs with the double basses sustaining in the background. Those are like creating sort of a background texture, but also some life. And then there's these other rhythmic uh, iterations. They're honestly, to me, it does not sound like there is primary material in this section. Like maybe this, when it comes in, becomes primary material, but I'm still most consciously aware of these runs. Those aren't, haven't really moved into the background. If I had to orchestrate this today, because I'm probably not going to have an E-flat clarinet and three uh, flutes, I'm probably going to put, um, I might put like two um, like harmonic celli divisi on the flute chord and then like put flutes in the chord, like one flute in the chord 
and like maybe a clarinet in the chord to have wind sound. So clarinet is the lowest note, so it's not too prominent. Flute as the higher note, or like a low piccolo as the higher note. And then I would have um, violas, or sorry, um, celli playing harmonics just to blend that sound and have a high sound there. You can also have the basses doing it, but maybe you don't have as many basses, so you need some celli as well. And then the principal flute doing the little like run up gesture to it if I didn't have an E flat clarinet. Um, I think that that would also work quite well to, to um, do this gesture. You could also have a, a, a normal clarinet play it. It's just gonna be a little bit more like um, strident and forward when it gets into the higher notes than the E flat clarinet is. The E flat clarinet in this case allows it to stay quite reserved throughout this entire passage. That's basically it. Basically does this for quite a while. So I think clarinet material is, is the important material. The clarinets are actually playing the same gesture that the, the trumpets just previously played. Okay. Whoops, I went slightly too far. Okay, this movement actually, I think the genius of this movement is not so much that this movement creates wildly original orchestral textures or melodies or things like that. I think what this movement does in a very genius way is it sets the stage for things to occur. So I could see this being having dancers on stage or people moving around during this move, music because it's almost like it, it's incidental music. It needs to be behind something else. And I think that that, in a lot of ways, is probably the genius of this music. So if I was gonna score a film or something like that, like John Williams did, uh, this would be a great section to look at, to lift music when you want the music to just sit in the background and not be too obtrusive to the action that's happening on the stage. Which is probably why, as I've been listening to this, I've, I've thought of like three or four different movies. Um, the most, most of note are like a couple moments in Star Wars and then um, The Dark Crystal, which I think has that running gesture in it. Yeah. So this last texture again is more chordal parallelism. parallelism. You've got this and you've got the, the flutes sustaining on this high gesture. He's removed the anacrusis to it, so it doesn't sound like it's getting in the way, anything like that. Wow, we're actually gonna make it through this entire introduction. Let's go. Flutes and horns work really well together. I really like that sound. Oh, I like this a lot. So, uh, That's really good. Starts with B flat in the clarinet, so. This has a ton of tension in it because of the chromatic motion in the horn. The rest of the instruments are playing E flat. Nice. Oh no, sorry, that's not what it plays. They play. That's got a cool sound. It's like kind of like a by Idlo or whatever from Ravel or Rimsky Kors. No, not Rimsky Korskov. Mazorsky. Sounds like that. The bull. That the bass clarinet there, this is like, it had such a huge deepening to that sound. It's like, it's very obvious in terms of texture. This is obviously primary material and everyone else's background material.
Oh, come on, Stravinsky, we need something else. <laughs> he just continues this melody into the next section. With this secondary material here at the end. It's probably, maybe it will sound primary material because we've heard the horn repeated so many times. I'll listen through it. Uh, that's a really cool cello part. Ah, oh, it's great. It's a great cello part. It's following the harmony underneath. So, it's down here. So that cello part is following that. neat. It's a line that almost when you play it by itself without that bass underneath it, it makes no sense. Like, okay, whatever, this is this giant angular line. But then when you play the bass underneath it, it makes so much sense. And I really like it as a contrast because everything else in this section has been so like parsimonious, just moving like this. The bass is not moving very much. It's just moving around a tiny bit. The horn is very hardly moving at all. Bass clarinet is just like gluing things together underneath. And then this line comes in, which is angular and moves through a large register. Nice. That's a great gesture. I just, I, I actually really want to understand the chords that are happening here. So the first chord that we have is, it's a fifth. E flat, B flat. The second chord that we have is another fifth. Wait, yes. C, and then another fifth, and then another fifth. Never mind. I don't need to understand the chords. They're all fifths. <laughs> Why was I having such a hard time understanding them before? Oh, I think it's because the double bass transpose is down an octave, so I'm like reading it above the above the celli, and I'm going. That's a fourth, but it's not a fourth. It's a fifths. Parallel fifths. There, Stravinsky gets a, he fails. <laughs> Parallel fifths everywhere, terrible music. Um, and then, so yeah, he's just, all he's got really here is a bass line, this horn motive, which we've heard before. And then the, all the, um, the bass clarinet is doing is just kind of like pedaling a note through there and then resolving it into the major chord. So down here, bass clarinet is here. Bass clarinet stays. Then when they go back, bass clarinet stays again. And then here, moves to the major chord. Oh, does it? No, it moves to this chord. Stacked fifths. Because that E flat is gonna sound like a C sharp D flat. Okay, we did it. We made it through the introduction for the second half of the Rite of Spring. I am now according to the recording that I am following, which is in the description below. I am now at minute 21. So I have 13 minutes left to go. I'm actually making pretty good time through this piece. So if I can finish this piece in less than 15 episodes, that would be incredible. But I think that my progress and my speed is gonna slow down a lot as I try and rip apart the sacrificial dance.